All right. Welcome, everyone. I am super excited to have you here and to have one of the people that I, I think, Ron, I'm going to embarrass you a little bit, but you're one of the people I admire most um, for your thinking, your pushing the industry to think differently, and your willingness and generosity to share your best practices, your knowledge, and, um, and really to have those tough conversations with people to, you know, to kind of challenge and you know, challenge the way they're thinking. So I'm delighted. Thank you so much for, for, for being here today. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you. I'm going to go on mute and I'll be behind the scenes. And um, folks, if you have questions, pop them in the Q&A and I'll be um, addressing them as soon as they are relevant to what Ron is, Ron is talking. And hi, everybody, by the way, you're all saying hello. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> we love you all. Hi, Liz. <laughs> okay, awesome. let's go ahead and get started. All right. Well, thanks, Allison. And thanks. Thank you, everybody for attending. I'm, I'm really honored to share this with you. Uh, I've been kind of marinating in this topic for the last four years. And I think we've landed on a model that would really uh, just transform uh, the business of uh, financial professionals, professional firms, accounting firms, whatever you may be in. And uh, because we're moving from a transactional relationship to one that's based on the relationship. You know, we talk about accounting and finance being a relationship business, and it is. But when you look at our business model, there's a disconnect because what is it that we're monetizing? We're monetizing the services that we provide. We're monetizing the scope of work. Well, I think everybody on this call is greater than the sum of their scope of work. Uh, I don't think the services are where our value is. The services are a means to an end. Our value lies somewhere else. So uh, my first question for everybody to get people thinking is, what would happen if Disney ran accounting firms? It's an interesting question because I think they would approach it with fresh eyes. It wouldn't, they wouldn't consider it a commodity Disney there's nothing Disney does that is a commodity or a grudge purchase that I hear all the time uh, they would plus the offering they would go to the market with an offering that is very very uncommon you can bet their pricing would be at a premium level not at a commodity based level and so I think that's a useful thing to think about how would uh, Disney attract talent? How would they change the customer of ex experience in dealing with accounting firms? And I think that's an interesting thought experiment. So Walt Disney, I borrowed this concept or stole this concept from him because I absolutely love it. He said, we've got to constantly plus our offering. And he meant, he meant mostly the theme park, you know, Disneyland. And what he meant by that is we've got to constantly add to the guest experience. We've got to find ways to plus it. This is what brings the guests back. This is what lets them discover new things and be delighted in new ways, things they've never seen before. They constantly plus this park. This is part of Disney's to this day. It's part of their DNA. And they actually still use that word plussing. And I think it's what we need to do as professionals. Folks, we need to up our game. Let's face it, the world has changed. Expectations of our customers have changed. Your customers deal with Amazon. They're prime members. They go on and buy things one click, and they get stuff delivered sometimes the same day, if not the next day. And they get all of this content. They get constantly added uh, benefits to their prime membership or their Hulu, you know, their Hulu subscription, their Netflix. Whatever they subscribe to, that offering has been plussed. This is one of the things that makes this model, I think, so compelling and yet challenging at the same time. You cannot go to the market with a common offering. And let's face it, you know, no matter where we are on this diffusion curve, 84% of us are copying one another. We're not innovating unless we're on the far left side. Now, I've been preaching value pricing since 1989 because that's the year I did it in my firm and I started teaching it in 1994. So I've been on a crusade to bury the billable hour and get rid of the timesheet across uh, the entire professions, not just accounting, but law and every other one. And I would say on that mission accomplished, 
we're in the early majority. We got through the innovators. We got through the early adopters. Now it took 20, 30 years, but now it's time to slide all the way back to the left with the subscription business model because the theme for today is very simple. Common offerings or common services command common prices. And yet it's only uncommon offerings that command uncommon prices. So I think we need to up our game because we're being compared to Amazon one, you know, one click. We're being compared to Disney, Nordstrom, and other incredible service providers because I believe we compete against any organization that has the ability to raise our customers' expectations. So your digital experience of interacting with your firm is being compared not to other accounting and bookkeeping firms, but to Amazon. I'm comparing my grocery shopping experience, not to other grocery stores, but to Amazon's. So this is a really important point because I hear a lot of people say, oh yeah, we do subscription, we do subscription. And they say, because our, we take our annual price, we divide it by 12 and people pay us monthly. Folks, that's not subscription. That's a payment term. That's a financial arrangement. It has nothing to do with the subscription business model. We're not talking about a pricing change here. We are talking about a complete revamp of the business model. This is as radical as going from a taxi cab to Uber. It's as radical as going from a hotel to Airbnb. It's as radical as going from buying CDs to subscribing to Spotify or Pandora or Amazon Music, Apple Music, whatever, wherever you get your music. This is a business model change. And that means at least two things change. The pricing paradigm changes, the pricing strategy changes, and also what you measure, your dashboard, your KPIs, they all change. I'm going to show you a subscription model income statement, and it is completely different than a regular GAP income statement. It's one of the problems with GAP. GAP can't handle this, and we're going to talk about some of the reasons for that. So welcome to the subscription economy. That was a term coined by Teen Zoe. You're going to meet Teen in the next slide. And yes, I am going to make these slides available after the presentation. So um, you, you will get a PDF of the slides. But the, the subscription economy is projected to become a one and a half trillion dollar, uh, you know, subset of the economy by 2025. It's at about 650 billion today. Over the past 10 years, the subscription businesses have grown at a 17.5% compounded annual growth rate versus 3.8% for the S&P 500. During the two years of COVID, subscription businesses were the only ones that were growing at an incredible clip compared to the rest of the economy. And in those same uh, COVID years, their churn rate, the number of customers they lost, and of course that translates into lost revenue, uh, actually went down because subscription uh, models are more flexible. So they were able to get out in front of COVID, allow their customers to pause, or maybe even redo their pricing or their payment terms. Uh, I, I saw many different businesses deal with COVID in many different ways, but they got out in front of it and people really appreciated that. And so the subscription model, I mean, if you track the things that you can subscribe to, we all know the, the common ones, Netflix, Disney, Hulu, you know, Amazon Prime, but there are so much more uh, products and services that you can subscribe to. You, I can subscribe to a home with Rome. I can live in some 40 countries, I think it is, on a monthly basis, and I can move around, and I can subscribe to a Porsche, and not, not just one Porsche, but I have access to a fleet of Porsches, like seven different models, and I can change out as much as I want. This is the plus in the offering. It's not just one car. I'm not just buying or leasing a car. I'm actually subscribing to Porsche. I now have a one-to-one -one direct relationship with Porsche. That's a completely different psychological model uh, of a business than buying than in just engaging in a one and done transaction. And this is what I find so compelling about this model. When you run a subscription firm, your customers are not buying a pallet of services. They're not buying a scope of work. They're subscribing to your firm. 
they are now, and in fact, I think we need to change our terminology from customer to member. They become a member of your firm because membership has its privileges, just like American Express used to say. And there's so many other things. I can subscribe to a boat. I can subscribe to, there's a company that I love called Hassle uh, Free Home Services. They come out to your home for a couple hundred bucks a month, I think it is, maybe 250 and they just take care of all the stuff around your house that's on your weekend to-do list. You know, change the air conditioning filters and the smoke alarm batteries and, you know, clean up everything, make it, fix broken screens and all, all that maintenance stuff. They take care of it. But then if you want something big, if you want a bathroom remodeled or, or a deck built, they'll also handle that. They may wrap it into the subscription price or they may just do it on a on a one off base charge, but they're only going to do it if you're a member, if you if you subscribe to them. And that just makes the relationship of the subscription model. It's it's all about friction, being frictionless with the customer. They have a frictionless interface at every point, whether it's digital face to face, it surfaces simplicity. It's very easy. They pay one price. They pay it monthly. And that's it. We've now separated the work from the pricing. And uh, I think that's really great because we're not putting a cognitive load onto the customer every time we have to add a service or every time we have scope creep. Um, you know, we have to go to the Department of Paperwork and get a change order. Uh, and, and I think the cardinal sin, sin today is to waste our customer's time. And I see the profession do that. We send out 200 page tax organizers expecting the customer to fill these things out. This is no way to treat our customers. We have to plus our offering. And so I think the subscription economy is, is obviously, it's doing nothing but growing. Most of the unicorns that are out there are all based on the subscription business model. Of course, all the software that you buy to run your firm is all based on subscription as well. And Team Zoe is the founder of Zora, the uh, subscription-based software platform based in San Francisco that sells the software that helps you run everything about a subscription business model. So it does the accounting and the payments and all that type of thing. And he says in five years, you won't buy anything. You'll subscribe to everything. Now, I'm not going to go that far. Uh, I, don't, I don't believe that's true. But what I will say is in five years, you will have the option to subscribe to everything and irrespective of how your firm whether you do anything with this or not you're going to be confronted with it because your competitors some of them if not more of them are going to be offering this model and i think customers gravitate to this model because again it's frictionless it's convenient it it provides peace of mind because in essence what you're saying here is Mr. and Mrs. Cust Mr. and Mr. Customer, Mr. and Mrs. Customer, whatever you need that we are capable of providing, and we're going to talk more about that because that's an important line, that we are capable of providing. In other words, we have a, a, a professional competence in it. You're covered. You're covered. If we do tax and you get audited and we, and we defend audits, you're covered. It's all part of the price. And uh, what I, again, what I love about this and, and what is the most challenging about this is you're, and you're going to struggle with this. You're going to be in that liminal space where you're not really sure what I'm telling you makes any sense, but we're separating the services from the pricing because the services aren't where your value is, but that's yet what we try and monetize. And that's what I think uh, therein lies the opportunity of subscription. It gives us an uncommon offering. And it is a business model change. It's not just a pricing strategy change. This is not another arrow in the quiver of pricing strategies. This is a complete revamp of your business model. So you might have to redo your purpose. You might have to redo your strategy. And you might have to redo your firm's positioning in the marketplace. We saw this when we moved firms from hourly billing to value pricing. Most of the time, they had to redo their purpose and their, and their pricing and their, uh, I'm sorry, their purpose and their strategy and their positioning because they became a different firm. Value pricing is a completely different business model than, than hourly billing. And it's the same with subscription. In fact, I would say it's even more radical with subscription. It requires you to, to rethink basically everything. 
because now you also have to plus your offering. You have to go to the market with something that's uncommon. You can't just say, hey, we're, we do cast work and we do tax work. Well, everybody does that. What separates you? What makes you, what makes you different? What's that differentiated value? What is it that can command a higher price? Now, if you want to be a low price firm, like an H&R block or something like that, this model you know, can work for that as well. Value pricing can work for that as well. Value pricing doesn't always mean a premium price. It can mean, it can mean a Southwest Airlines. It can mean a Costco. It can mean a Walmart. But I'm kind of interested in working with firms that want to be more boutique, that want to be more upscale, and that want to charge a premium price. And I see the ability of subscription to increase your pricing anywhere from a factor of two to five times. So when we talk about the business model change, uh, we're talking about, again, not only changing the pricing, but also changing the KPIs and the very accounting of, of how you report on a subscription model and what you measure. So this is a, a sophisticated group. I don't have to explain the left side of this. I don't even have to explain the right side, the subscription p &L is starts with annual recurring revenue at Vax out churn. Notice how it puts in and categorizes costs as recurring. In other words, if this was a product company, the cost of goods sold would be future directed. Everything's directed at that sales and marketing because that's the cost of customer acquisition and that becomes a very big KPI as you'll see when I show you the KPIs. But then you add the new annual recurring revenue that you gained that year, or, or it could be monthly, depending on your reporting period. And then you end up with an ending annual recurring revenue. So this financial statement is forward directed. It doesn't just look backwards like traditional accounting statements do. Um, you know, tr To run your business with traditional accounting statements is like timing your cookies with your smoke alarm. By the time you see it in your account or on your timesheet, you can't do anything about it. It's like crying over spilt milk. It's, a, it's, it's the ultimate and lagging indicator. The subscription model forces you to think about annual recurring revenue and growing that. It also puts right in front of you every month your, your lost customers. This churn is going to be a fact of life. It's a fact of life under hourly billing. It's a fact of life under value pricing. You know, we lose customers for a whole host of reasons. This forces you to study those reasons and to make sure that that churn trend is not trending in the wrong direction. Um, and so I think that this puts a lot of very interesting things on our radar screen on a regular basis and forces us to pay attention to them and forces us to up our service and our offering to our customers and to continuously plus it, to continuously add new things that we can offer to our customers. And I'll have a little bit more to say to that when we get into KPIs. The other thing is when you look at the evolution of our business model in the profession, in the accounting profession, we kind of started, you know, with, uh, with hourly billing, obviously that's been around for about 70 years in the accounting profession. It's been around a hundred years in the legal profession, by the way, the lawyers were the ones that started it. We did not start hourly billing and timesheets. A firm and a law firm in Boston, Massachusetts did that guy by the name of Reginald Heber Smith was the first person to introduce both the timesheet and the billable hour to his firm in 1919. He was a Harvard educated lawyer and he's responsible for it. It took another 40 or 50 years before our profession kind of picked up on it. But either way, hourly billing prices, the inputs, you know, how much effort, how much activity are we going to put into something? And then when I joined the profession in 1984 with a then big eight accounting firm, we offered fixed fees for everything, especially our audits. Audits were fixed fees. And even some of our tax work, sometimes we would bundle the two together. Uh, now, if there was additional work that was out of scope, we always went back and build it by the hour and we build it in arrears. We weren't giving prices up front. And by the way, how did we determine the fixed fee? We did it based on how many hours we thought. So it was still based on hourly billing, but rather than pricing the direct inputs, it kind of looked at the outputs and said, okay, we're going to charge this much for the tax, this much for the audit. And then when value pricing came along, at least the way that we taught it, 
was that you're no longer going to price the services. You're going to price the customer because every customer is different. Every customer has different uh, subjective perceptions of value. Well, then now value pricing 2.0, sometimes I refer to the subscription model as is 2.0, but what it says is you price the relationship, not the customer, the relationship and the portfolio of customers. And people say, well, come on, Ron, what's the difference between pricing the customer and pricing the relationship? It's a big difference because just like with the Porsche subscription I was talking about, now I have a relationship with Porsche. They're not pricing the car, they're pricing the relationship. And we're going to talk about another model that I think even explains this better, because after all, Porsche sells cars, but uh, in the professional world, I think there's a model that uh, is already got proven empirical evidence that it works and, and works quite well um, that we can learn a lot from. And uh, but first, let me describe what the subscription business model is, because rather than it doesn't price inputs, obviously, it doesn't even price outputs. It prices the outcomes. And that's really important. And I'm going to take that word outcome and I'm going to substitute another word. Really, it prices transformations because that's really what accounting does. It provides transformations. It moves the customer from where they are to where they want to be. We financial professionals do this all the time with our customers. We just don't think of it this way. We don't recognize it this way. And we don't use the language that communicates it in this way for our messaging and our marketing and our value proposition and even our branding. But when you transform somebody, how do accountants provide transformations? Well, they do all sorts of things. They help their, their companies grow their business. They help uh, their, company, uh, their customers' companies become more profitable. They plan their retirement. They plan their kids getting into college. They plan their legacy for after they're gone, if they do estate planning and, and uh, you know, tax planning. And those are all transformations because they have nothing to do with the services. They're moving the customer from where they are to where they want to be, some desired future state. Now, if you think about an architect, they kind of do this too. They, they sketch your dream home, but they first try and figure out how you live and do you entertain and what kind of things do you like and, and all of these different things. They transform you when they put you into that new home. And you can think of, you know, plastic surgeons do this and you can think of a lot of different professionals that do this, but we do it too. And yet we don't use this language. We, we talk in terms of scope of services and, oh, yes, we'll do that. And, oh, you added employees or you added accounts, so the price has to go up. And th that's, that's not where the value is. The value is in guiding those transformations because they are guided. And when you provide a transformation, the customer is the product and the service. And that's what's really interesting about it. And I think that's what's really powerful about it. So... In my mind, the subscription model is a periodic recurring payment for a frictionless, ever-increasing value and serial transformations. That's what we're talking about. That's what we're talking about because we can do serial transformations. We can do one transformation after another. It's only limited by the, the customer's capacity to want to move to a new state. And I think if we focused on that, and realize that the services that we perform with our hands and our brains are just a means to the end. The end is the transformation. Because after all, if you think about what it means to be a professional, a professional is someone who takes responsibility for achieving a result rather than performing a task. And right now, folks, whether you're doing hourly billing, whether you're doing value pricing, you're charging for tasks. You're charging for services. There's no way around it. If you look at even the firms that are value pricing, even the firms that we taught that are value pricing and don't have timesheets, they'll offer three different options. And that's great. It, it's, it's far superior to hourly billing. But those three options are normally and usually based on scope of work. In the higher price tiers, you get more services. That's not what it's like in subscription. 
with subscription. It's not about scope of services. It's about being covered and not being covered. So you can still have your three options or two options under subscription, but the meaning changes because of course it's a different pricing paradigm. It's a different profit formula than it is with hourly billing or value pricing. So let me, let me show you what, what this Michael Hammer quote, what it translates into in the medical profession, there's been just an absolute revolution. I mean, like a tectonic shift going on. And it started in 1996 with concierge doctors. So the first concierge doctor was a guy named Howard Moran. Some of you may recognize him if you're from Seattle, because he was the Seattle Sonics uh, team doctor for the NBA team. And he started MD squared because he said, I know so much about my players when they get injured on the, in, in a game, I can run out to the court and I can get them back up. And because I know everything about them, I know their history. I know what drugs they take. I know what, you know, they're allergic to all. He, he says, why don't I know that about my patients? And he said, well, because I have 3,400 patients, the average general physician in the United States of America has a panel of patients of 3,400 now. And they're in a fee-for-service model. They're trading dollars for, for services. Doctors are paid for what they do to you, not what they do for you, but what they do to you. So they order tests, they draw blood, they, you know, they, they, come, they want you to come back for a visit because they don't get paid for consultations. They don't get paid for FaceTiming and doing emails and things like that. Well, Howard Moran with MD Squared, the company he founded, which is now the largest concierge medical practice in the United States, he changed all that. And he, when he did it, he went after the top 10% of wealth earners in the country. If you subscribe to MD Squared today, each doctor cares for 50 families, and that's it. That's their capacity. And because of that, they can come to your home, they can come to your office, they can give you same-day appointments, they respond to you when you text, Facebook, email, you have access to your healthcare records, digital interface is seamless there's no waiting rooms in their offices for the most part because they run at such a low capacity that they always have spare capacity and this is one of the things i think that's very frustrating for a lot of people with accounting firms is that they have too many customers and they you know the last thing i want to hear from my dentist when you know when you have a toothache is well yeah we can fit you in in two weeks in fact i just uh, tried to get an eye appointment with my with my uh, eye surgeon and it, I called him in early October. He can't see me until late December. That's, that's almost three months. So what does that do to me? Well, I had to go, go pick another doctor, get another eye exam, you know, go somewhere else for everything, glasses and prescription and all this. This is, this is a cardinal sin to waste the customer's time. When I do get in to see him, I'm going to read him the riot act and tell him you need to set up a subscription where people can subscribe and then you put them to the front of the line. You can still have fee for service if you want, but you know, these doctors that have done this, they don't take insurance, they don't take Medicare because you're subscribing to them. So meet Dr. Paul. Dr. Paul is the founder of Plum Health, which is outside of Detroit, Michigan. He has a panel of patients of 600. So DPC doctors are the baby cousins of concierge doctors. They go for a lower price point. They're, they're kind of like a, a, a Hilton Garden Inn compared to, say, the Ritz-Carlton or the Four Seasons of a, of a concierge doctor. They just go after a completely different demographic. And Dr. Paul is in Detroit, so his monthly subscription price is less than $100, and that's pretty common for the DPC docs. And he's a general physician, so when you subscribe to him, whatever you need that he's capable of doing. Now, he's not going to do cardiac surgery. He's not going to do oncology. He's, he's, you know, he's limited by what he decides that he wants to do. But for whatever he can do, you're covered. He'll come to your home. He'll go to your office. You can come to him. He usually has no wait no wait time at all. He knows all about you. So he's not going to hand you a clipboard and make you ask those, you know, answer those hundred questions that we do with, with normal GP doctors. And the average appointment time with a DPC doc is one and a half hours, not five minutes like there is with the doctors that are in the fee for service model. And I think the fee for service model is as deadly 
for us as it is in the medical profession. It's burning doctors out. It's causing all sorts of depression and, and just burn out with the, you know, this is not why they entered the profession. They entered the profession to help people. And Dr. Paul is living that dream. So th this, this puts the focus back on why did we enter the profession? You know, I've been asking this question for a long time. Why did you become a professional? And whether you ask a doctor that, a CPA that, a lawyer that, somebody in advertising, an actuary, they all tend to say the same thing. Now, not all of them. I've heard very, you know, I've heard to make money. I've heard uh, job security. But the predominant answer is to help people. To help people. Well, how can you help people if you have 3,400 patients? <laughs> you can't spend any time with them. You spend five minutes with them. You see 60 a day, the typical doctor. And half the time of that five minutes is you're, you know, typing into their electronic health record. One doctor said I became a better typist than a doctor. And Dr. Paul avoids all that. He gets to look you in the eye. He gets to spend time with you. He gets to get a very deep family history and get to know everything about you because he's not just interested in the, the problem you present with. He's not just there to cure you when you're sick. He's there to keep you healthy. Well, so are our accountants. We keep our, we keep our customers financially healthy. We're there to not just keep them out of trouble, not just to solve problems. Yes, we do that. We solve problems, get the IRS off their back or, you know, correct mistakes or, get, you know, whatever. But solving problems, folks, isn't enough. If all we do is solve problems for our customers, then we're just reverting them back to the status quo. We're not advancing them. Transformations advance the customer because they take them to a desired future state. Now, we guide those transformations. We don't do them, but we guide them. We help the customer in any way that we can. That may or may not include performing services. Sometimes it's just consultation. Sometimes it's just coaching. Sometimes it's just asking them difficult questions, but it's not correlated with selling a pair of hands where we have to do work and data entry and tax returns and all this other stuff. It, it's, it, it puts us on a different plane, I think, when we talk about guiding transformations. So that forces you to think about the revenue model question. And I love this question because it is, what are you asking your customers to pay for? And I think this is a brilliant question. And uh, take Fender for a minute. Fender is the largest guitar manufacturer in the United States. When they figured out that when people buy a guitar, especially you know beginners, we're not talking about a pro musicians, but when somebody buys a guitar, they're all excited. They may, may have lessons scheduled and they wanna learn what they found was over 90% of those people played somewhere between three and six months and then gave up, <laughs> said, this is just too hard. And the CEO of Fender said, then they take the guitar and they put it in their closet or they put it under the bed. And he said, and what's worse is eventually they may donate that guitar or, or gift it to, you know, a sibling or a friend. And he said, and then we're out another sale. So in 2000, I believe 16, they started Fender Play which is a digital library that you could subscribe to that taught you how to play from literally beginning to, you know, intermediate to advanced. And they, they got, they had many subscribers, hundred thousand or 200,000 subscribers, I think it was. And when we all got locked down in COVID, they opened it up Fender play. And they said, if you want to learn how to play the guitar, have a three month trial on us to Fender play. And in 2019 and 2020 2021 the covid years they sold more guitars than they ever had in their entire corporate history and what the ceo said about this incredible digital transformation was that we figured out we're not selling guitars we don't want our customers to pay for a guitar they're paying for musicianship md squared said we don't want to sell a fee for services, you know, cure you when you're sick. We want to sell good health. And I actually met the bookkeeper at Scaling New Heights uh, for MD Squared. She was from Seattle and she was at, with MD Squared since they founded. She's the one that set up the chart of accounts. 
And she used to ask the CFO when they got their money. And by the way, MD squared is about $32,000 a year for a, for a couple plus about four or five grand per kid. So again, we're talking about the top 10% that they, you know, they're going after the CEOs. They're going after people who have more money than time and time is very precious to them. And so the last thing these MD squared docs do is waste patients time. That's why they'll come to you. They'll come to your office. They even fly to where you are. If, if you get sick, like say, if you're traveling in Europe or something, they will fly to you and they will uh, conduct your care, make sure that you're getting proper care, um, which is phenomenal, but they can do that because they have 50 families that they take care of. And she would get these checks and she, she said, where do I code them? What, what did we do for this patient? And the CFO said, I have no idea. We did whatever they needed. They're not paying for what we did to them. They're paying for access to us when they need us. They're paying us for what we can do for them, not what we did to them. And there lies the, the challenge, I think, with the mindset. We're divorcing the payment and the price from the scope of work. And then you have a company, Sinsan, which is the largest uh, eyewear company in the Nordic countries, Scandinavia, I believe. And I think they're about 190 a month, maybe 200. I've never done the, the, uh, the, the foreign currency translation. But bottom line is when they started, they said, we want people to be able to get an eye exam, as many as they need, and, and get a new prescription if that's required for their contacts or their glasses. And we'll upgrade all of their all of their lenses, and we'll do that as much as they need. And people said you'll never be able to do that. This is a very mature industry. It's very staid. People are used to the routine, even though it's a big pain in the butt. They said nobody's going to want to subscribe to to eyeglasses. And since Sam said that's not what we're asking them to subscribe to, we're asking them to pay for perfect eyesight. Now. Folks, there's a big difference between buying eyeglasses and an eye exam and paying for perfect eyesight on a recurring basis. If any of you have a Roomba, the little vacuum cleaner, you know, that, that runs around your house and cleans whenever you want it to, and then it goes and plugs itself into its base and then it empties its bag and it knows it, it communicates back to the company and they know when you need new brushes and new bags and they just send them out automatically, you're not buying a vacuum cleaner. You're paying for clean floors. My, my, my colleague Ed Kless uh, subscribes to a vacuum cleaner, a Roomba. It's like 30 bucks a month. But he said, I realized that I'm not, it has nothing to do with vacuuming. I'm paying for clean floors. And, and this is what makes the subscription model, I think, so poignant and so salient. It puts that issue right in front of you and forces you to think about it from the customer standpoint. We don't want our customers to pay for accounting for tax services. We want our customers to pay for financial good health and to achieve their goals and, their, and, the, and the transformations that they set for themselves, whether that's get their kid in college or plan their legacy or grow their business or retire early or buy a second home or whatever it might be. We can help with all of that, but it's kind of divorced from the services. So, uh, I think that's what's really interesting about the revenue model question. So ask yourself, what do you want your customers to pay for? Because we are what we charge for. A business d is defined by what we charge for. And I think by going to the market and saying, you're buying musicianship, if you buy a Fender guitar, you, you're paying for good health. If you're with a concierge doctor or a DPC doc, by the way, the DPC docs, there's about 1800 of them across the United States. They're growing, they're growing like weeds. Uh, doctors are, are, are more and more leaving the traditional fee for service business model, which in my mind is just like the hourly billing model. And even, even dare I say it to some extent, the value pricing model where we're trading services for dollars, they're leaving that starting a DPC, uh, practice and they're, they're thriving. And again, they max out somewhere between 500 to 600. Just to give you an example, Dr. Paul, who we've interviewed on our radio show four times now, he started out, he was one person. He didn't even have a personal assistant. He certainly didn't have a physician assistant or a nurse. Now he's got three other doctors working for him. He's about to open up a second office and put two or three doctors in there. And, and 
they all hit that 550, 600 number of patients, and then they stop taking patients. They, they have a waiting list. Every one of the docs has a waiting list. Um, and my dad just joined a DPC practice in South Carolina where he is, uh, him and his wife. And uh, they had to wait a while to get into them, but it's just a different level of care. There's none of that. You know, I, I think it's patient abuse, what the medical profession does to uh, patients, but, but not if you're with a DPC doc. So anyway, um, one of the questions that we often get with this model, so I thought I would deal with it here, and uh, I'm not seeing any questions yet. I know, uh, Pat Patrice, you said you'd love to see the engagement letter for this. So would I, by the way. Um, you would still have engagement letters, by the way. You would still have engagement letters for if you did tax or audit or any type of consulting. You know, you still you you still need to comply with your insurance company's requirements for engagement letters. However, the the subscription agreement that you have would just say this is what you're covered for, this is the monthly price, and that's it. And by the way, with subscription, here's another difference. Under value pricing, we advocated that you should offer a value guarantee, which is basically uh, a guarantee that says, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, customer, if you're not satisfied, only pay for the value that you received. Now, that was usually done on an annual basis because with value pricing, you have a fixed price agreement. Usually, it covers one year. And if your price was 10000 and the customer, for some reason, was unhappy, they might only pay you eight or seven or six or whatever. And that was the value guarantee. And we thought that the value guarantee was a, a big value enhancer. It was a big competitive differentiation. In the subscription model, it's a bit different because the value guarantee becomes the cancel button. At every interaction with the customer, on your emails, on your website, it's really easy for them to cancel. You gotta make it easy for them to exit. And when you do that, when they know they can leave any time, they tend not to. It's the darndest thing. It's very counterintuitive. There's a lot of economic, you know, behavioral economic reasons for it, but uh, you know, not a lot of people leave netflix now netflix a few years ago they actually they canceled about three hundred thousand subscribers because they weren't using netflix they pay every month on the credit card but they never went in and accessed it and netflix says listen if we're not adding value to your life we don't want you to pay us so we're going to cancel you unless you tell us within the next 30 days that you want to remain a member but otherwise, we're going to cancel you. And they did. They ended up canceling. I believe it was somewhere between 200 and 300,000 people. And, you know, a cost accountant would never recommend that. A cost accountant would say, these are the best customers. They pay every month and then they don't use you. <laughs> that's not the, the subscription model. That's the last thing they want. They want you to use them. Dr. Paul has to train and re-educate his patients to come and see him when they feel fine one of the biggest challenges with the DPC doctors is they just don't want to see you when you're sick. They want to see you a lot more than that because they want to keep you healthy. They might want to work on your diet or other, other goals that you may have and, 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 and solve some co, co, co mm -hmm. morbidities, things like that. So anyway, um, it, it, it's, it's, it's a very interesting uh, thing that you can easily cancel a subscription model. Um, yeah, Ron, there's a, a good comment from Lauren that I think is pretty timely to what you're saying that yep. um, isn't the um, subscription model sort of based on the fact that not everybody will fully use the the services? Uh, not necessarily. It, some customers are going to use you more, maybe in some months. And but it's it. this is what we mean by the portfolio as well, that, you know, some customers are going to probably need you more at certain times than others. So you're kind of you're you're kind of averaging it out across the portfolio you know when we look at uh, profitability we're analyzing it as the total firm and now of course we're trying to grow uh annual recurring revenue and we're also trying to grow customer lifetime value but i don't want people to sign up and pay the firm without using you know at least some core services that they're being covered for um the um question from Patrice about what what software Patrice there's a lot of software out there that can handle the billing and the and the subscription model I um, 
you know, Blake Oliver is a great source for this. The cloud accounting guys, they, they stay up on all the tech and all the different apps. Uh, Zora is out there, of course, but Zora is very, very, very expensive. It's mostly for bigger companies. Um, so I, I, I defer, I'm going to defer you or send you over to Blake Oliver to answer that question. Um, but one of the questions that we get, and I've already alluded to this when I told you about the home, uh, the hassle home free services, um, when they build a deck or they remodel a kitchen, that's not part of their, you know, monthly coming out and, and doing the, the, the repairs and maintenance in your home. They charge that separate. So if you have a one-off project, here's the thing you, you can, um, you can obviously charge an upfront price and just make it separate and then move them onto subscription. Some firms have asked me, can you do a longer term commitment? Can you have them sign up for a subscription, but make, but lock them in for two or three years so we can amortize that price. And my answer to that is no, <laughs> because the whole point about subscription is it's gotta be easy for them to get out of. No, none of us like to be locked into long-term contracts with our mobile phone or our cable company. We hate that. So that violates to me the spirit of subscription, which again is frictionless, convenient, and peace of mind and surfaces simplicity. Don't lock them into a contract. That's not the point. You could increase the subscription price at the start and then lower it over time, you know, month by month, actually lower it until it, it goes back to the normal price to cover that, that one-off project, like a cleanup job that you might've done or something like that. The other thing you can do and this is, of course, highly dependent on the number of customers your firm has. So it's very hard to answer these questions across the board because it's, it, context is critical here. The devil's in the details, and the details are your firm, your firm's particular strategy, your positioning, how many customers do you do, what kind of services do you offer, are you niched? All of those things take on greater significance with subscription. But the enterprise choice says you customize a subscription plan for that one customer. Now, that's fine, except if you find yourself customizing a subscription plan for every customer that you onboard, well then at some point I'm gonna say bake it in, you know, bake it into your offerings and then just charge a simple price for it on a monthly basis. The other thing is just to trust your value. And this is what we're starting to see with companies that or firms that make this transition. Like for instance, um, there's software vendors out there that are, uh, you know, they help uh, do accounting installations or CRM or ERP, whatever. And, you know, that's a lot of upfront work. And outside of the cost of the software, it's still a lot, you know, it could be a 50, 60, 75,000, $100,000 engagement. Well, we know a couple firms that just say, you know what, we're going to do it. And you're just going to sign up for our regular subscription. And we're just going to trust our value because we know when we come in and do something like that and we add tremendous value up front, you're going to stick with us for life. Because one of the interesting things about subscription is uh, if, you, if, you, um, if a member retains you for a year, you have a 90% chance of them staying with you for life. So there's a whole mindset, I think, that says, you know what, just trust your value. Take that cost of performing that cleanup job, say, and just put it to cost of customer acquisition and then trust that the customer lifetime value is going to exceed that in the long run. Now, sure, you're taking a risk, but it's a very prudent risk. And uh, because what you're doing with subscription, and again, when I say there's a different profit formula, this is what I mean. The profit formula is no longer how much did we make on that job? How much did we make on that customer? How much did we make on that hour? which is even more absurd. It's about creating lifetime annuities that are far greater in value than what it costs you to acquire them and maintain them. Yeah. And, and, and Ron, I can say as a marketer, it costs a lot to, to get a new customer, you know, it's, and, and you, and then you have to educate them, onboard them, bring them up. So keeping, keeping your existing customers happy and with you, I think is, is the winner, but I do have, we, uh, Julie has a great question about, and I think, I think a lot of people are wondering this. Um, I'm gonna paraphrase the question a little bit, Julie, but I think the concern is that you would, you'd be on call 24 seven. And I don't think that's necessarily what you're saying, is it? Like you don't have to be on call 24 seven, do you? 
Yes, I think you do. Um, th th this is what I mean by upping our game. Um, you, you know, listen, do DPC docs worried about this. They said, oh, geez, we're going to have hypochondriacs, you know, come and camp out in our office and they're going to be calling us all day and blah, blah, blah. And it, that's not going to happen, folks. 89% of the DPC doctors' phone calls come in normal business hours. Right. Um, Allison, I got a UPS driver. I heard. Yeah, on you my know door. what? We'll I'm, just chat. It's really I'm, fine. It's, I, I'm, we, I'm livid. Okay, hold it, on. It, I'll be right it's back. Really oh, on, it's really on, fine. It's really fine. We're live, folks. You can tell. Um, yeah, and um, I think it's Ted. Ted is saying the biggest objections you've heard to the new strategy are based on lack of trust. Yeah. Um, Jared's offered a tax subscription for tax work. So it gives them a choice of a thousand for the return or 150 for the month. Um, so Ron actually said at the beginning, Jared, that that is actually just to give, you're just giving them a billing plan, that that's not actually a subscription. So we can ask him, um, the subscription would be more like, um, you know, we're, it's going to be this price and you can call me and ask me questions at any time. And, and if you have any tax planning or tax questions, we'll handle it. And then the tax return is included. Um, and um, Pam, you're, uh, is it Pam? Um, Pam is saying, I think I will try to implement this with new clients for now because I don't care if they come on as clients. <laughs> um, yeah, we're going to get to that. So, the, so I don't have to go through these subscription KPIs. You guys can figure this out. I've, I'm, I've got a resource slide in here at the end that gives you two reports from Andreessen and Horowitz, the famed venture capital firm, Silicon Valley. And they go through all the different KPIs that they use to invest in subscription businesses and to value them. And they're really well done. So I don't feel the need to go over those. But I do want to talk about, um, you know, the AICPA says it costs 11 times more to acquire a new customer than to retain one. So that's a really important fact. But somebody asked, how, did, how would you pivot to this? Here's what we've learned so far. And I think this is really critical. There are three subscription strategies to pivot from your old model, whether your hourly billing, value pricing, to jump to this. And that is you launch a new firm. You take a firm, Give it a different brand. It's got a different strategy. Maybe it's a different positioning in the marketplace. And eventually that new firm is going to overtake and cannibalize the old one. And that's a very successful strategy. The second one is you slowly evolve. You say, okay, we're going to test this. We're going to put new customers on subscription, or we're going to do this in our cast department, or we're going to do this in our tax department. Um, and you slowly evolve it. And then the third model is the Adobe model. Adobe said, okay, as of January 1st, whatever it was, 2012, I, I forget the years, it's about 10, a decade ago, they said, we're no longer selling software in a box. You're gonna have to buy all of our products in the cloud online. And of course, everybody went nuts. The investors hated it, the stock tanked. But they said, as of this date, we're no longer selling box software. We're not going to support it anymore. We're not going to upgrade it anymore. That's it. It's done. And that was, you know, a, a transformation. It was really interesting. It, it was very risky, of course, but it was quite successful. Now, that's a very hard thing to do. It's very hard for a business to disrupt itself. This is why, you know, most companies are disrupted by outsiders and startups and things like that. Um, so Zora, who keeps track of all this because they have a database of hundreds and thousands of customers, and they can, they can watch what happens when a company pivots from a legacy business model to the subscription business model. They say the, prescrip the, the prescription here is model A. That's the one with the highest probability of success. Model C can work if you're Adobe, <laughs> if you're Apple, if it, we saw Intuit do this, right? They, they offered cloud, but still had desktop. You know, uh, most of the software companies did. Salesforce obviously launched with subscription and kind of changed the world. But 
C is very difficult if you don't have good managerial talent. B, folks, <laughs> it's the model that almost guarantees failure, according to Zora. Um, and look, this is, this is going to be something that's going to have to be tested. I tend to think that if you're just going to experiment with subscription, you're going about it all wrong. You got to be fully committed to this model. It is different. You're not going to be able to do your normal standard offering. You're going to have to up your offering. It would be as hard to do model B as it would be for Dr. Paul to have insurance and Medicare patients and be on a fee for service model for some patients and have subscription for others. You're, you're trying to sell Cadillacs and Rolls Royces out of the same dealership. It doesn't make sense from a strategy position. It doesn't make sense from a positioning standpoint. You know, strategy is all about making decisions about what your firm is and who you serve. In fact, I think your firm's strategy is defined by the customers you don't have and the services you don't perform. You can, simply can't be Morton's and McDonald's and vegan. You have to decide which one. Now, you could be all three if you had three different brands, but strategy requires us to make tough choices, to make trade-offs. You can't be all things to all people. So obviously, the early adopters to this model, the easiest ones are niched. They already know, their, they know everything about their customers. So it's easy for them to put boundaries just like it's easy for Dr. Paul to say, I'm a general physician, I don't do surgery. Um, and I only work with dentists, so I know exactly what dentists need from womb to tomb. So if you're niched, this is gonna be a little bit easier. That's not to say you can't do it if you're not niched. Uh, do we have any other questions? I well, I think people are starting to agree. They're just like, uh, Patrice is okay, you're right. Um, the I think the for me, the the insight of just starting the new firm, like you could still have your old firm keeping the keeping that if you wanted to, you could keep some staff over here, move some staff over here, or just completely just start a new firm. But I think that to me, and I, I've, I think we've got accounting firms out there that have done that, that are creating new and definitely, definitely the doctors, doctors yes, are definitely doing it. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Jake asked a good question here about, uh, tried to offer subscription for tax work. Let's give them a choice. One K for the return or 150 a month. Um, you, you can't give them a choice, Jake, you got, you got to put them on a the monthly payment. Um, and you just got to trust that you're going to do the return. Now, if they leave after you give them the return, um, well then was it a client you wanted anyway? I mean, there's something wrong there and that's not a pricing issue. Most of the time when we get questions around, how do I price this? How do I deal with this? How do I do this? What about this situation? Most of those are not pricing questions. They are strategy questions. For example, I have a colleague, he does nothing but dentists, that's it. He knows exactly the type of dentist he wants. He wants a single office. Sometimes he, he does have a few of them that have a couple different offices because they might do different types of services in those, in those two different offices. But he just works with dentists. Anybody that comes to him who's not a dentist, he sends to another CPA colleague of mine. Uh, he doesn't touch anybody who's not a dentist. Now, he puts them on subscription. He's a sole proprietor and he has about 12 team members. He handles them from womb to tomb. He has seen it all. He knows everything that a dentist could possibly go through. He knows the economics of dental practices. He knows all the equipment suppliers. He knows how the insurance works. He, he's seen uh, practices split up when the partners want to leave, when they want to admit a new partner. He's seen divorce. He's seen disability. He's seen it all. He covers them for everything at one price. He's the most profitable firm I know in the world and that includes some of the biggest firms yeah well we are at time ron and i hate to do this because we could uh, but what i have done is i have put in the chat that you are on the grove and that people can put questions in the new business model space for you and that you'll come in periodically and answer them so that's a great way i think to engage um, and then, of course, you've got your book coming out. Yes. So and when is your, oh, and of course, your podcast as well. Folks, if you want to know more about the subscription business model, 
go to the soul of enterprise.com right on the home page you will see show categories drop down that menu hit subscription model and you'll see every show we've ever done we've interviewed yeah. four of the leading authors that have written books on subscription john warlow and and teen zo who you met and a couple of others we've also interviewed dr paul that you'll see there four times I've done with Ed Kless, my co-host, a bunch of shows, just us talking about the various aspects of subscription, you know, capacity management, project management under subscription, pricing under subscriptions, how is it different, what's the same, what's different than value pricing, all those issues. Um, you can find that all. It's all available. Solo yeah. Enterprises is a podcast. You can also subscribe to it on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher or Google Play, whatever. You can also find me at uh, on Twitter. You can find me on LinkedIn. I'm one of the influencers, but I do have a new book coming out on subscription. It's going to be out December 7th. If you go to the soul of enterprise.com slash times up, you will see uh, a pre-order club. If you pre-order the book on Amazon, send us your receipt to the email shown there. We will put you into the pre-order club. And on, I think it's December 12th, we are going to be doing a virtual event with me and my co-author, Paul Dunn. And many of you may know Paul Dunn. He's a He's legend. Awesome. He's, He's awesome. He's awesome. He's awesome. And we wrote this book together because yeah. we wrote The Firm of the Future together a decade ago or two decades ago, actually. And so we'll be doing two virtual events, one this year, one probably early next year in the first quarter. You get some other benefits as well. So you can check that out at the soul of enterprise.com slash times up. And yeah. um, you can also email me and you can also find me on the Grove. I'm happy yeah. to continue this conversation or point yeah. you to more resources. Well, as always, Ron, it's amazing. I hope that people, I think with the um, with the chat, with the active, active chat, I think people's people's minds are are spinning. Um and I also want to call out that we actually have um, someone from Australia who joined us today, Lilette. So hi, Lilette. Um, so that's, we, we, we went international today, Canada and Australia and the United States. So, all right, folks. So we're going to go ahead and wrap this up. We will be, oh, and UK, we've got Jeremy as well. Oh, awesome. Sorry, missed you, Jeremy. Um, so we're going to go ahead and wrap this up. And what we're going to do is, um, is we'll make this, uh, Make this make this recording available, um, and uh, the, I just have one question: What did you get from UPS? That's the only thing I, I need to know. Well, Allison, this was is it the, something the, interesting? Was it good? Is, was it good? We this just is, need to this, know: Was it good? This is the dangerous thing about living in Northern California. Of course, it was, it was wine. wine. It was so wine. of course I had to sign they for it. They couldn't and, leave and, it at it, the door. And I, I chewed the guy out for that. Trust me, I was pissed that he kept bugging me oh, so i apologize he's just doing his job he's, he is but usually they'll leave it but he's yeah. a new driver so he couldn't yeah, yeah. he doesn't know you yeah he oh. will next time though <laughs> awesome all right everybody thank you so much ron will be in touch yeah. and we'll send out a the recording to everybody and i hope you enjoyed this and if you haven't joined the grove um it's uh the grove at the grove.thinkific.com and um we will see you all soon and Ron, thanks awesome. again. Thanks, Allison. Thanks, everybody. Bye.